Right, well, tonight we're going into Genesis chapter 3. And it may be of interest to you to know that if you listen to any of the carol services, the nine lessons and carols that come from King's College Cambridge and various other places broadcast this Christmas, one of the set lessons for Christmas is Genesis 3. And you'll always hear it read at these festivals of carols and readings. And there's a reason for that, and I hope you'll see the connection between Genesis 3 and Christmas as I read a paraphrase to you. Now, you know it so well in other versions, so this may again just bring it home freshly to you. Now, there was a deadly reptile around, more cunning than any of the wild beasts that the God who really is had made. And he chatted up the woman. You don't mean to tell me that God has actually forbidden you to eat fruit from any of these trees? She replied, No, that's not quite the situation. We can eat the fruit on the trees, but God did tell us not to eat fruit from that one in the middle. In fact, he warned us that if we even touched it, we'd have to die. Surely he wouldn't do that to you, said the reptile to the woman. He's just trying to frighten you off because he knows perfectly well that when you eat that fruit, you would see things quite differently. In fact, you'd be in a position to rival him, able to decide for yourself what is good or bad for you. So she took a good look at the tree and realized how nourishing and attractive the fruit appeared to be. Besides, it would obviously be an advantage to make one's own judgments. So she picked some ate part and gave the rest to her husband to eat which he promptly did sure enough they did see things very differently for the first time they felt self-conscious about their nudity so they tried to cover up by making crude clothes out of fig leaves that evening they heard the approaching sounds of the God who really is and ran to hide in the undergrowth but the God who really is called out to the men, What have you got yourself into? And he replied, I heard you coming. And I was frightened because I hadn't got any decent clothes. So I'm hiding over here. And he said, How did you find out that you were naked? Have you been eating the fruit I ordered you to leave alone? The man said, It's all the fault of that woman you sent along. She brought this fruit to me, so naturally I just ate it. Then the God who really is challenged the woman. What have you been up to? The woman said, It's that awful reptile's fault. He deliberately fooled me and I fell for it. So the God who really is said to the reptile, As a punishment for your part in this, Above all the beasts I will curse your ways with a fate that is worse on your belly you'll slither and thrust with your mouth hanging down in the dust for the rest of the days of your life there'll be terror hostility strife between woman and you for this deed and you'll both pass it on to your seed but his foot on your skull you will feel as you strike out in fear at his heel then to the woman he said let the pain of childbearing increase, the agony, labor, and stress. Your desire for man never cool, though the price will be that of his rule. But to Adam, he said, because you paid attention to your wife rather than to me and disobeyed my order prohibiting that tree, there's a curse on the soil. All the days you will toil thorns and thistles will grow among all that you sow with a brow running sweat you will labor to eat then return to the ground in the state you were found as you came from the clay you'll go back the same way Adam gave his wife a name Eve it means life-giving because he realized she would be the mother of all human beings who would ever live then the God who really is made some new clothes from animal skins for Adam and his wife and got them properly dressed. 
And the God who really is said to himself, Now that this man has become as conscious of good and evil things as we have been, how could we limit the damage if he is still able to eat the fruit of the other tree and live as long as us? To prevent this, the God who really is banished him from the park of delight and sent him back to cultivate the very same plot of earth from which he had been molded. After he had been expelled, special angels were stationed on the eastern border of the Park of Delight, guarding access to that tree of continuous life with sharp and scorching weapons. Father, we'd just like to ask again that your spirit of truth will take this old, old word and make it so fresh to us that it's as if we're hearing it for the first time. And I pray, Lord, that if there's one person listening to me tonight who's not yet your child, that your Holy Spirit will touch that heart tonight. For your name's sake. Amen. I begin with that uh, drawing behind, which can now be switched off. The world is out of order. There is something terribly terribly wrong with it. In Genesis 2 you've got a picture of an idyllic place where anybody could be happy. There's a sense of joy, of peace. When you read Genesis 2 you just feel good and you understand why God looked at all that he'd made and said that's very good. But I don't meet many people today who say the world's very good. Do you? To quote one person, one man said to me the world's in a hell of a mess. And I said, if you're using that word with the same meaning as I would use it, then you're absolutely right, because hell is to be without God. And when you look at the present state of the world, you say, that is surely not as it left God's hand. There's something terribly wrong about it. It is out of order. Take just three very painful facts of our existence, three universal facts of human experience. Number one, our birth into this world is a painful process. It seems as if it's a struggle even to get in here. Did God plan birth to be like that originally? It's a strange bit of planning. When you consider that the moment that starts that process is a moment of one of the most exquisite physical pleasures that we can know. And yet it leads to one of the greatest struggles a woman will ever know. And it's the woman who has the pain, not the man. And that seems a bit of bad planning. Something is wrong in that. You would not have planned it that way. Neither would I. Neither did God. And that's just the beginning of this mortal existence, which is one big struggle for existence. Right through life, it is a struggle to make ends meet. We're fairly well off in this country. We're fairly comfortable. And we don't realize that two-thirds of the babies born in the world today will not live to see maturity. Never mind old age. And the whole human race is struggling to get enough food, struggling just to survive. And life is one big sweat. And we're in this strange tension that we want work and yet we don't. That we feel if we're unemployed we've lost our dignity, our identity, our self-respect. And yet if we get work we find ourselves in such drudgery and struggle that sooner or later we get bored with it and we rebel against it, we want a change of job. And, and somehow the work situation seems badly planned. But God didn't plan it that way and when we get to the end of the life what a struggle it is to die for most people it is a losing battle against the inevitable and it's one of the most painful things how each of us hopes that we'll just be walking down the street and be gone and a few people have that but the majority don't and I think more people today fear dying than death. It's a struggle. And if you've ever sat and watched it, it's a hard struggle to shake off this mortal clay for most people. Did God plan the world that way? No, he didn't. It wasn't like that. And I could just go on, but it's these things that...